think so. Good afternoon and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity today to discuss with you uh, the optimal treatment of women with advanced HER2 positive breast cancer. Here are my disclosures, and as you can see, I am consultant for uh, the company Roche Genetic and some others, of course. So, um, I guess everybody is very aware that HER2 positive breast cancer represents approximately 15 to 20 percent of all breast cancers, and roughly 60 percent of these HER2 positive breast cancers will co express hormone receptors. Before starting to discuss the optimal treatment of these women, I would just like to make a parenthesis. I really believe that medical oncologists should collaborate very closely with pathologists. <clears throat> pathologists play a key role in helping with the identification of these women who have uh, HER2 gene amplification and HER2 protein overexpression in their tumors. And this is just a table that reminds us about the uh, classification uh, for HER2 positivity. In most cases, uh, the situation will be an easy one where we will have, using a dual probe, a HER2 um, chromosome, uh, centromere of chromosome 17 ratio of two or more, and a mean HER2 gene copy number of four or more. So these are clearly HER2 amplified cancers. And then we have the opposite where the ratio is below two and the mean HER2 copy number is below four. And these are clearly HER2 negative cases. But then you see from the table that there are in 5% of the cases situations which are a little bit more delicate and where the pathologist will really play a critical role and will have in general to complement the, uh, the use of a dual probe uh, to look at uh, gene amplification with immunohistochemistry because that is what will allow the distinction between a HER2 negative or a HER2 positive tumor. And why is it so important that we do not miss these patients with HER2 positive breast cancer, a substantial proportion of whom present with de novo disease? Well, the reason is that this is the breast cancer subtype where we have seen the greatest progress. And what you can see there are the expected five-year survival rates for these women with HER2 positive breast cancer from 1995, where it was in the range of 10%, to 2015, where it is now in the range of 34%. So huge progress and an obligation not to miss uh, the diagnosis of these patients in clinical practice. So this is the plan of my talk. The main focus of my talk uh, will be on uh, current treatment standards for these patients, but I will also talk a little bit about potential tools for improving treatment tailoring. And at the very end, I will just say a few words about new upcoming strategies, because what is fascinating is that there are still a lot of activity in terms of new drug development for this disease. Okay, so what I have illustrated on this slide is the uh, eight compounds that are targeting the HER2 receptor and that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Unfortunately, not all these compounds are accessible in all the regions of the world. My understanding is that Bangladesh uh, has or will have access to protuzumab and TDM1. Um, and that, of course, if it's true, is very great news for the women with this disease. 
So as you can see, the very first anti-HER2 drug trastuzumab is a monoclonal antibody that is targeting the um, domain four of the external portion of the HER2 receptor, which is close to the membrane. Pertuzumab is the second anti-HER2 monoclonal antibody that is targeting domain two, uh, which is the dimerization domain that authorizes uh, dimerization of HER2 and HER3 uh, receptors in particular. Then we have another family of fascinating compounds, antibody drug conjugates, which in fact are linking a potent cytotoxic drug to trastuzumab to bring the cytotoxic drug specifically to the HER2 positive cancer cells, sparing the normal tissue to a great extent. And the first drug there with impressive activity, excellent tolerance is TDM1. But there are two new antibody drug conjugates on the horizon, and we will discuss them very briefly at the end. And then we have three oral drugs that inhibit the tyrosine kinase of the internal portion of the HER2 receptor. The oldest one uh, is lapatinib, but there are two newer ones which are probably going to supplant lapatinib because they are more active, and these compounds are niratinib, an irreversible HER inhibitor, and tucatinib, a selective pan-HER2 inhibitor. So we have a lot of new compounds, but then for the clinician, the critical question is, how do we optimally sequence these agents in advanced disease? So in fact, the question is, uh, with all these actors on stage, which should play the first role, which should play the second or the third role? And this is what we are going to discuss in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. I want to say that uh, we are very fortunate because in advanced or to positive breast cancer, we have seen the conduct of very well-designed, powerful randomized clinical trials that have generated impressive overall survival gains. And that is probably why the uh, sequencing of the agents, the anti-HER2 agents, is not the subject of a lot of controversy, just because of the solid results of the trials that you see summarized on this slide. The first trial, Cleopatra, was a trial conducted in the first line setting. It compared docetaxel and trastuzumab with docetaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab, it demonstrated an impressive overall survival gain of 15.7 months. Side effects were minimally increased with dual HER2 blockade. We have to note, however, and I will come back to that, that at the time this trial was conducted, there was only a small proportion of patients included in the trial which had seen trastuzumab before and patients with CNS metastasis were excluded from Cleopatra. Then we have a second very famous trial, Emilia, for the second line setting, which compared what was the standard at the time, capecitabin lapatinib, to the new drug TDM1. And here again, an overall survival benefit was demonstrated, which is not so frequent in metastatic breast cancer. The side effect profile was clearly favoring TDM1. These patients were heavily pretreated with trastuzumab, but at that time they, are not, they have not seen pertuzumab, and a small proportion of patients with controlled brain metastasis were included. And finally, the third famous study, Teresa was a trial conducted in more heavily pretreated patients who had been exposed to trastuzumab and lapatinib. The randomization was between the physician's choice and TDM1, and TDM1 was the winner, again, with a survival benefit close to seven months, again, with the demonstration of a very favorable side effect profile. And 
you can see that a small proportion of patients in this trial entered with controlled brain metastasis. So let me uh, briefly uh, summarize these trials in slightly more details, starting with Cleopatra, where 805 women uh, were randomized to receive docetaxel, trastuzumab, and placebo, or docetaxel, trastuzumab, protuzumab. The minimum number of recommended chemotherapy cycles was six, and many patients got indeed six to eight cycles of chemotherapy in this trial. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival determined by independent review, and secondary endpoints included overall survival, PFS investigator assessed, response rate, and safety. Now, this is a complicated table with the patient characteristics, but the only important point I would like to make is this one. In Cleopatra, only 10 to 12% of patients received prior adjuvant trastuzumab. A substantial proportion of patients also had de novo metastatic disease. In terms of a side effect, uh, what the, the, there were very good news because the combination was generally well tolerated with a slight increase in the occurrence of diarrhea and rash and slightly more upper respiratory tract infections, infections but no increase in cardiotoxicities. And you see the striking results that were updated by Sandra Swain in the New England in 2015 with this impressive overall survival, a median of 56.5 months in the protuzumab group compared to 40.8 months in the control group, uh, which of course makes this regimen the uh, undisputed first line regimen, particularly for patients who have not been previously exposed to trastuzumab, so the patients presenting with de novo metastatic disease. Now, a quick parenthesis. Uh, at a certain point in time, the question became whether the Troy horse, so TDM1, given with pertuzumab, could perhaps be an even better regimen than a taxane with trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And this led to uh, the design of this Marianne trial, where a very large number of patients, 1,095, were randomized to receive what was the control regimen at the time, so taxane and trastuzumab, not taxane and trastuzumab plus pertuzumab, versus TDM1 and placebo or TDM1 plus pertuzumab. I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing the trial, but you know that uh, TDM1 and pertuzumab was not better than taxane and trastuzumab. And therefore, everybody believes that the standard of care for patients in first line remains the combination of docetaxel or paclitaxel, pertuzumab, and trastuzumab. Now, let's move after a first line with trastuzumab. What is then the first choice? And here, we will, of course, refer to this important EMILIA trial, randomizing 991 patients who showed progression um, in the metastatic setting or after six months of adjuvant trastuzumab. Randomization was between TDM1 or the standard treatment at the time, capsidabine lapatinib. Primary endpoints were PFS, OS and safety. Again, a complicated table, but it allows me to make the point that a majority of patients in this trial were not heavily pretreated. They received only zero or one prior therapy in the metastatic setting. 100% had received prior trastuzumab, the majority in the metastatic setting. And we see here again the striking positive results favoring TDM1 in Emilia in terms of progression-free survival, but importantly also in terms of overall survival with a median of 31 months compared to 25 months for capsitabine lapatinib. 
Very important in a palliative setting is patients, the patient's quality of life. And here again, TDM1 was the winner. It had a better safety profile with less diarrhea, less palmar plantar erythrodysesthesia, less vomiting, less mucosal inflammation. Of course, capsaicin lapatinib was associated with uh, less uh, problems with liver function tests and less thrombocytopenia, but TDM1 uh, turned out to be clearly the better tolerated therapy. Now, of course, things have changed since these trials were conducted. Now, of course, in uh, rich countries, at least a lot of patients receive trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and a taxane first line. So is TDM1 active in these patients in the second line setting? Well, you can find in the literature some relatively small series, but several series that suggest that yes, TDM1 works slightly less well than in Emilia, with a median time to treatment failure around seven months as compared to close to 10 months in Emilia. But clearly the drug keeps an interesting activity there. And then of course, a second question is, should we really give TDM1 in the second line setting or should we try to give trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and chemotherapy instead after a first line that involves a taxane and trastuzumab. There is a trial that tried to answer the question, but this trial unfortunately did not meet its primary endpoint. The FEREXA study, as you can see, compared in these patients progressing after a taxane and trastuzumab, xeloda plus trastuzumab or xeloda plus trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And although there was a modest increase in median progression-free survival, it did not reach statistical significance. And this was the primary endpoint. So therefore, the apparent improvement in overall survival that you can see there uh, cannot be credited. So to me, this trial is not as robust as Emilia, and therefore, I don't think that this should be the preferred strategy in second line. I think TDM1 remains the preferred strategy in that particular scenario. Now, just a few words to tell you that in case a patient has missed access to TDM1 in first and second line, it is still worth considering TDM1 in third or fourth line. Teresa was indeed a trial for heavily pretreated patients that had seen trastuzumab, lapatinib, and taxin. It compared TDM1 to treatment per physician choice. There was an optimal crossover load. Primary, co-primary endpoints were progression-free survival and overall survival. Again, just a quick point. If you look at patient characteristics, these are patients with very advanced disease. More than 60% had seen more than three lines of therapy in the metastatic setting. And all patients had seen trastuzumab and lapatinib. And here again, there was a very good surprise with a significant improvement in median progression-free survival favoring TDM1 and also an improvement in median overall survival, again, favoring TDM1. I just want to briefly share with you an interesting clinical case uh, of my institute. So this is a patient who was treated in another hospital for um, her initial diagnosis. She had a neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus trastuzumab, then surgery with a good response, but it was not a complete pathological response. And then because there was co-expression of hormone receptors, she went on to receive anastrozole and trastuzumab. After 18 months, she came back with a local relapse that was operated by the surgeon. She was then put uh, by uh, another oncologist outside of my institute on tamboxifen and trastuzumab, which was able to control the disease for 11 months. 
Then there was again a relapse and a new surgical operation. And then this oncologist decided to continue with endocrine treatment and trastuzumab, which was again able to control the disease for 19 months. Then the patient came to our institute for a second opinion because she had developed a thoracic wall relapse. And at that time, we decided to give her TDM1. And as you can see, uh, she uh, experienced a complete response under TDM1, which uh, was continued for 18 months. At a certain point in time, there was a significant and worrisome increase in the liver function tests. So we decided to stop TDM1 and switch the patient to trastuzumab. And she continued trastuzumab for 18 months and then progressed again in the same location with this thoracic wall lesion. And what is interesting is that we decided to re-challenge the patient. She uh, was put again on TDM1 and again developed a complete response. So clearly an interesting story showing that for some metastatic patients, TDM1 can work for months, if not years. Now, as I uh, pointed to you, uh, the oncologist in Belgium who was in charge of that patient uh, treated her for quite some time with endocrine therapy and trastuzumab. Is that the right choice for these patients? Or should we instead give lapatinib or another uh, TKI? Or should we even think of giving dual her to block it? So here I will share with you my personal opinion. As you may know, there have been two famous trials conducted for patients with metastatic triple positive disease. The protein trial summarized on the left and the alternative trial summarized on the right. First remark, these are relatively small studies. And you know, it is always dangerous to conduct small studies because you very rarely are able to demonstrate an overall survival gain. If we look at the protein trial, it is a trial very difficult to interpret because there was a possibility for the oncologist to start the treatment with chemotherapy and then randomize patients to endocrine treatment and trastuzumab or endocrine treatment and trastuzumab plus pertuzumab. So this is essentially a first line trial, but it's not investigating endocrine treatment alone. And there was a small improvement of three months in median progression-free survival at the cost of more diarrhea. The second trial is a little bit more easy to interpret. It is a second line trial. So patients were more heavily pretreated. In this trial, patients were randomized to receive endocrine therapy with either trastuzumab or lapatinib or the two anti her 2 drugs together. And this trial showed that endocrine therapy plus dual her to blockade was better than endocrine therapy plus trastuzumab. But it was not demonstrated that it was better than endocrine therapy and lapatinib. At the end of the day, none of these trials showed a survival benefit. And this is why in my current practice, I do not use dual her to blockade with endocrine therapy. I use endocrine therapy with single her to blockade. And in patients with more advanced disease, I tend to use uh, her to TKI rather than trastuzumab. So if you want to summarize, uh, up to 2019, there was a, a consensus that the first line treatment normally should be a taxin with trastuzumab and pertuzumab. The second line treatment, based on what we have already discussed, should be TDM1. And beyond these two lines, the recommendations are a little bit less strict. You can decide to use, for example, capecitabine and trastuzumab or capecitabine and lapatinib. And just a parenthesis, uh, some oncologists for a long time believe that 
La patinie, perhaps, could delay the onset of brain metastasis, but this has not been demonstrated in the cerebral trial conducted in France. Uh, there was no advantage to the use of capecitabine and lapatinib over capecitabine and trastuzumab for the onset of brain metastasis. And then I just want to remind you that in heavily pretreated patients, we can also think of using uh, lapatinib and trastuzumab without chemotherapy because there has been one randomized trial showing that this dual heart to blockade strategy is superior than lapatinib alone in these heavily pretreated patients in terms of overall survival. But this scheme will change. In 2020, we have uh, the, third and the third line, at least, treatment for her to advanced breast cancer challenged by new HER2 tyrosine kinase inhibitors, neratinib on one hand, and tucatinib on the other hand. And it's important to quickly summarize these randomized trials that make me think that lapatinib will be less and less used in these patients. You see a, a summary of these two trials here. The NALA trial involved 621 patients with at least two prior lines of treatment for advanced disease. It compared neratinib capecitabine to lapatinib capecitabine, a one-to-one -one randomization ratio, and it showed a benefit of neratinib in terms of progression-free survival. An absolute gain of 2.2 months. Unfortunately, it did not show an overall survival gain, but it demonstrated a reduced need for intervention for brain metastasis. Unfortunately, uh, neratinib has some significant side effects and there was a 14% discontinuation rate for adverse events in the neratinib arm and quality of life was not improved, which is of course a negative point. If we now turn to the her 2 clam study, this is a study that enrolled heavily pretreated patients. They were all exposed to pertuzumab and two TDM1. The randomization according to a two to one ratio was between tucatinib trastuzumab capecitabine versus trastuzumab capecitabine. And here we see quite strong results. First, a progression free survival benefit, but also an overall survival benefit, which is remarkable. And interestingly, in this trial, patients with brain metastasis, even active brain metastasis, were allowed to enter the trial, and they also benefited from an increased progression-free survival and a, de a delay in the use of radiotherapy. The drug is better tolerated than neratinib with only a 6% discontinuation rate for adverse events. But surprisingly, no quality of life improvement was demonstrated in this trial, but I think it has to do with uh, the use of the wrong instruments to measure quality of life. Just a quick uh, summary of a fascinating clinical case uh, one of my patients um, who, if you look at the history, never, never showed a significant response to trastuzumab-based treatments or to antibody drug conjugates. The patient presented with de novo metastatic uh, disease and received TDM1 as first-line treatment in a clinical trial. She did not respond. She progressed after three months. As you can see, after that, she received several chemotherapy regimens with the addition of trastuzumab. Uh, but she progressed uh, on all these treatments. She was stable for five months on lapatinib and trastuzumab, then went on to receive capecitabine and trastuzumab, a clinical trial with a new antibody drug conjugate, but she did not respond. She got a ribulin and trastuzumab, did not respond. 
Gem cytabine carboplatin, trastuzumab did not respond. Liposomal doxorubicin and trastuzumab and did not respond. And then we gave this patient neratinib and letrozole. And she had a very drastic response. On PET scan, we could see an almost complete disappearance of all the metastatic lesions. And this is just to make the point that there are probably patients with HER2 advanced disease where for some reason, the HER2 receptor is masked or is perhaps not accessible by the antibodies and where you can see strikingly better responses to the TKIs compared to the antibodies. So we have to keep this in mind. And if we see poor efficacy of antibody-based therapies, we need to think of giving these uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Now, we have discussed uh, what is today in most guidelines around the world, the optimal sequencing of her to target the drugs. The situation, however, is a little bit disappointing for the 21st century because these uh, treatment recommendations do not take into account the biology of the tumor. Is it possible in the future that we will be able to embrace tailored treatment sequences? And here, I think that we will need in the coming years to uh, learn more about tumor heterogeneity, the importance of the tumor stroma, and in particular, the importance of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and also perhaps the importance of tumor genetics, in particular, PIK3C mutations, which, as you know, are documented in up to 40% of patients with advanced her to positive breast cancer. So let us start with um, tumor heterogeneity. I really believe that we are underusing molecular imaging. Molecular imaging is capable of telling us a lot about tumor heterogeneity in advanced disease. And I just want to share with you the experience we had with a clinical trial conducted a few years ago in Belgium and the Netherlands. This is a trial where we uh, used labeled trastuzumab to perform a HER2 PET scan and try to learn more about how different metastatic sites are able to recognize the targeted drug trastuzumab. So, Essentially, what we did in this trial is a dual imaging. First, an FDG PET scan that you can see on the left. And second, a HER2 PET scan using zirconium labeled trastuzumab. And what you see here is the same patient. So clearly, what you see is that some of the metastatic lesions detected on the FDG PET scan are not seen on the HER2 PET scan, suggesting that trastuzumab is not able to reach all the metastatic sites. And this is what we call tumor heterogeneity. So we did conduct this elegant trial, the Zephyr study, uh, that enrolled patients where the physician had decided to give TDM1. So these patients did undergo, prior to the start of TDM1, two PET scans. First, an FDG PET scan. A few days later, a HER2 PET scan. They also consented for a biopsy of a metastatic lesion. Then the treatment was started. We repeated the FDG PET scan very early on and also after only one cycle and also after three cycles. And after three cycles, we performed the routine tumor evaluation with CT scan. What did we learn? Well, we learned that advanced or positive breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease with four patterns of imaging. So what you see on here on the left is always the FDG PET and on the right, the HER2 PET of the same patient. Under A, you see a patient where all the lesions detected on the FDG PET are also detected on the HER2 PET. 
So this is an homogeneous case. B is a patient where most, but not all, of the lesions detected on the FDG PET are detected on the HER2 PET. And A and B represent two thirds of metastatic HER2 positive patients. But one third of the patients show a completely different pattern. C is a patient where a lot of the lesions that you see on the FDG PET scan are not seen on the HER2 PET. And D is the extreme situation where none of the lesions detected on the FDG PET are seen on the HER2 PET. And why is this interesting? It is interesting because in the Zephyr trial, we saw that patients with um, images C and D, so the situation where a lot of the lesions on the FDG PET are not seen on the HER2 PET, these patients progress very quickly on TDM1. It's the blue curve. While the other patients, patterns A and B, can enjoy very long disease control with TDM1. So I am a strong believer that molecular imaging should be incorporated in the clinical development of all the antibody drug conjugates, which is unfortunately not the case today. Now, do we have some predictive biomarkers? Because what we would like are predictive biomarkers, not only prognostic biomarkers. Unfortunately, as you will see, what we have today is mostly prognostic biomarkers. So what we have been examining is whether the expression of some other membrane receptors on the cancer cells could predict for the efficacy of anti-HER2 therapies. We have also been looking at downstream signaling markers like PIK3CA. And more recently, we have looked at the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And very briefly, what did we learn? Well, first of all, in Cleopatra and Emilia, um, there was a look at HER2 mRNA levels. And what was shown is that high HER2 mRNA levels indicate a better prognosis, but they are not predicting for the efficacy of dual blockade or TDM1. In other words, trastuzumab, protuzumab, docetaxel, and TDM1 work both in patients with tumors showing high HER2 mRNA levels and patients with tumors showing lower to mRNA levels. So it is a prognostic marker. It is not a predictive marker, and therefore it is not used in the clinic. The second marker that got a lot of attention was PIK3C mutations. Again, and unfortunately, this turned out to be a prognostic marker, this time a marker of a worse prognosis. So if you look in Cleopatra, you can see that dual blockade works both in patients with a mutant phenotype or a wild phenotype. But the benefit, the magnitude of the benefit is a little bit wider in the wild type cohort. For Emilia, it is the opposite. The magnitude of the benefit of TDM1 appears to be somewhat larger in the presence of PIK3C mutations. But again, since all the patients have a benefit, this is not a useful clinical marker. And finally, well, just very quickly to tell you that a lot of work was done to look at a lot of uh, different receptors or downstream uh, proteins, but nothing turned out to be predictive of the benefit of dual HER2 blockade in Cleopatra. And finally, uh, and interestingly, we have learned that high tumor infiltrating lymphocytes indicate a better prognosis in Cleopatra, in advanced or to positive breast cancer. But again, it is not a predictive marker and the benefit of protuzumab has been seen regardless of the number of teeths. And now to end this lecture, 
very good news regarding the exponential development of a lot of new strategies for women with advanced or to positive breast cancer, strategies that we hope to bring to the adjuvant setting, because of course, it's in the early disease setting that we can cure more patients. Obviously, I don't have the time to discuss with you all these new compounds, which are now being investigated in randomized clinical trials. I think we will see very interesting results with CDK46 inhibitors being tested in triple positive breast cancer. There are clinical trials uh, with PIK3C inhibitors, uh, in particular PIK3C alpha inhibitors, and we have to wait for the results. We have seen preliminary results which uh, were not terribly exciting with immune checkpoint inhibitors, but again, we have to wait perhaps for better selection of patients. And there are also B-specific monoclonal antibodies in development, in development, antibodies that are targeting R2 and another receptor that can be another receptor on the cell surface like R3 or another receptor in the microenvironment. Because of uh, the lack of time, let me just share with you my enthusiasm for the new antibody drug conjugates. The two most advanced antibody drug conjugates in clinical trials are trastuzumab duocarmicin. Uh, so duocarmicin is an alkylating agent, so clearly it's a different cytotoxic compound compared to TDM1 because TDM1, the cytotoxic drug is metansin and it's an antimicrotubule agent. And then we have uh, trastuzumab derixtecan, which is also uh, a new compound where the cytotoxic drug, interestingly, is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. And what we already know is that these drugs can show activity after TDM1 in patients who have failed TDM1. And since TDM1 is now moving to the early disease setting, as you know, based on uh, the clinical trial, uh, Catherine, well, it's very good news that we have these new antibody drug conjugates that we will hopefully be able to prescribe in patients with uh, disease relapse. So I hope that uh, this talk was of interest to you and uh, comprehensive. And of course, I will be very happy to answer any questions or discuss with you if you disagree with some of my statements. Thank you a lot for your attention.